Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Let's turn back to, if, to Romans chapter 5, just as kind of a jumping off point. I, we'll see where this goes, but there's some truths that though we know intellectually, I think there's always a need to apprehend these truths in a deeper way. To see not just the doctrinal truth of something, but how relevant his truth and his word is to every day of our lives, because that's really what it's about. It's not simply about believing a creed and practicing a religion. God is up to something, and we need to be a part of it. And, uh, well, with Paul, you have to break into a thought Paul has expressed there about the fact that we have peace with God, we're justified through Christ, we have access because of him into grace, certainly nothing we have done. And he talks about the, the qualities that God builds in us through the things that we experience. And the fact that all of this is God pouring out his love into our hearts. It's not something where a tyrant is simply trying to bring us under his thumb, but it is the ultimate source of love of real love, not what we call it down here, but God in love reaching out to us to rescue us from a terrible condition. And that's why he goes on in verse 6, Paul does, to say, you see, at just the right time, you know, there's a, you could build a sermon on that, couldn't you? Doesn't God have a pretty good idea what the right time is? And we don't often, if ever. God is the one who knows the right time to do everything. It's a good thing when we could just let go and trust him, isn't it? Just the right time. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man some might possibly dare to die. Well, of course, you know, he's talking about human... Uh, evaluations there, we think of some people as good and some people as bad, but the fact is, by God's standard, uh, there's, none, there's none good, is there? No, not one. But he's just simply making a, a comparison with human condition. He says nobody's going to die for, you know, for somebody who's totally uh, in the condition he describes here. But there's one exception to that. But God demonstrates his own love. This is not just a theoretical love. This is a demonstration of love. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. Amen. Now, you know, it's interesting, the description there, and it's, it's one that cuts across human pride. We don't like to think of ourselves as being in the condition that he describes there, but the very starting point for having a relationship with God is to come on the basis of truth. Not the basis of how we would like things to be. Not the basis of, of our posturing towards God and saying, Oh God, I'm a pretty good guy. I just need some help here. This is coming as one who is powerless, as one who is ungodly, as one who is a sinner. Now, powerless is a pretty serious condition. That means I, you cannot help yourself. You're, you and I, come, as, as we come to God, are in a condition where there's nothing we can do, absolutely nothing that we can do to commend ourselves to, to a holy God, to make ourselves acceptable. We've got to come God's way if we come at all. And so he goes on to say uh, what we read recently, since we have now been justified by his blood, now, let's pause and, and explain that in English. Justified is, is kind of a legal term, but it has to do with whether we are viewed by God as righteous. Because apart from something happening, you and I are certainly regarded by God as lawbreakers, as sinners, as rebels, as anything but righteous. 
But here is a way that God has arranged to cause men to be able to come into a standing before him where he says he can look at us and say there's nothing wrong. There's no fault. There's no guilt. There's no sin. Oh, praise God. What a horrible burden God has removed from us by his grace. Oh, how willing we ought to be to take this place and just, on, just get off our high horse and say, Oh, God, my only hope of standing before you is based upon mercy and mercy alone. Praise God for the love that you have shown to me. Lord, I bow to it. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Folks, this world is headed for catastrophe. There's nothing a holy God can do about the sin and the guilt and the, and the corruption that is in this world except to obliterate it, to destroy it. And that's what's at stake in what he's talking about here. But oh, he's talking about another way, another, another hope, of another path that we can follow. But he says, for if... When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Now, everything about this just screams to us about the utter hopeless condition of a sinner before God. See, here, not only are we helpless, not only are we, uh, what else does he say, ungodly, not only are we a sinners, but we are enemies. Sinners is not just a bunch of oopses, of boo-boos, of whoops, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, you know, I'm really still a good guy, Lord. It's nothing like that. Oh, God, I am so helplessly trapped by this power that it has rendered me your enemy. But oh, we have a Savior who has gone and taken the guilt of our sin upon himself so that we can, by surrendering our lives, just repenting of our sins, turning from it, understanding what it is and saying, God, I don't want to go that way anymore, but you're the only hope that I have of rescue and help. Oh, blot out my sins, Lord, based upon what Jesus did. That's my only hope. Don't, you can't look at me and find any reason to do this, Lord, but Jesus took them upon himself. I put my hope in him. Yeah. You know, we said recently that it's not Jesus' death that saves us. Here's a situation where there's a king of a kingdom. He has a glorious plan for people. But the problem is the people that he has these plans for are locked in a death struggle against his kingdom. They have become enemies. They're part of a different kingdom fighting against his kingdom. So how in the world can, this, can such people ever fulfill the purpose that he has for them when right now their status is one of enemy? You see, the first thing he can do before we can ever fulfill the purpose of God for our lives is to do away with the, with the barrier that is between us. There has to be a complete reconciliation with God. Oh, what an awesome thing it is to think that we can think of God not with terror, not with dread. Oh, you know, we, we feel, we know we're not what we ought to be and, and, and what is he going to do with me? Not this, this sense of, of dread and fear and, and wonderment, but we can think of him as Father. We can have his peace. We can have the assurance that we are loved and accepted by him. What an incredible salvation he has laid before us. Oh God, you, you got something better to live for than that? Oh, I don't. This is, this is coming back to the reason we were made in the beginning, to come into relationship with, with him by the blood of Christ. But you see, now, now what he's done is taken us from the status of enemy to friend. Well, now we've, we've left one kingdom, we've been, made, we've been brought into another. So now the purpose for which he made us is still to be fulfilled. Well, how is that to happen? Does God look within me and say, all right, I brought you in. Now it's up to you. No, it isn't that way, is it? That's the glorious thing. That this one who died on the cross rose again with a life that has power over 
all sin, all death, all devils, everything that could possibly stand in the way of God's plan for you and for me. He removed it. He rose victorious. The life that is in him is God's very life. And it's that life that he imparts to us. He doesn't say, I expect you to live as a Christian now. Do better, straighten up, fly right. He says, I'm coming in. I know you can't live for me, but I'm coming in, and I'm going to live. And your place right now, see, so this is where salvation begins. Salvation, now, now notice something about this. Paul is, here's Paul, an apostle, well into his ministry, writing to these Christians, and he says, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved. What's the tense of the verb there? You know, this, this word saved is sort of tossed around in a very casual way by many, and, and, and in many cases, sadly to say, I don't think that people have a clue what it's about. They'll say, I got saved. As though salvation is just an event. Okay, now you're in, now you just got to wait and go to heaven one day. That's not what salvation is about. Salvation is about a transformation of our entire being. You and I were sinners. We were rebels. We were hopeless, unable to do, to be what God has made us to be. And now we have been brought into a relationship. Now we have a new a person who lives in, in, within us. But what's the reason? What's, what's that about? Paul's talking about a salvation that's ahead. It describes the entire course of what God does in a life. From the moment we are born of him, from the moment he comes in to live, there is a change that has to take place in our lives. And what is the nature of that change? It's so that we can be like him. What does John the apostle say? I mean, he's... he's has faith and confidence in God. He's served God. He's an old man when he wrote uh, the, the epistle to 1 John. He said, Beloved, you know, what an amazing thing it is that we should be called the children of God. And he's talking about little children there. He's, he's, he's pointing to the fact that we're just, we, we've been born into the family, but we're not yet what God has intended for us to be. He says, We don't know what we shall be. You know, God hasn't laid it all out for us. We, can't, we can, couldn't even imagine if he told us. We wouldn't believe it. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't get it. We, we would just be, okay, I can't quite grasp that, Lord. But, oh, we live and we walk by faith. We know what he has done for us. We know where we are at. I'll tell you, if Christ ever comes into your heart, you'll know it. You will know that there's something that has changed that's fundamental. You won't be acting the part of a Christian. You will know that there's a birth that's taken place. But John says... We don't know what we're going to be, but we do know that when he appears, we will be like him. So here is what salvation is about. It's taking sinners from this point, living in us, changing us, till we get to the other side. We're made like him. Oh, all of this stuff that just drives us and, and pulls us in every which way, that's going to be gone. It's going to be, man, won't that be awesome? Won't that be amazing to not have any cross currents in our spirits, but just completely set free? But you know, God is, is seeking to get us to, to cooperate, to understand what it, what it is that he's doing so that we can cooperate with him in the process. You know, we, we have the illustration that I guess we probably often referred to of the drowning man who reaches the point where he cannot help himself. There are only two alternatives when he reaches a certain point. Number one, he's going to drown. Number two, someone who has the strength and ability to save him is going to go in there and rescue him. But there's one thing that he can't do, and that's try to, you know, he can't continually fight and, help and try to help himself. He's going to have to surrender to the one who does the saving. That's exactly what God is looking for from you and from me.